What I'm really going to talk about today is whether there was such a thing as a genocide of the Armenians. Now, we have a real problem when we talk about genocide because no one knows what the word means. There are many definitions of what genocide is, of which I put a couple up on the, on the board here for you. Huh? If you'll notice, you can have, according to the United Nations definition, which is the most common one, genocide can be killing members of a group. Or in other words, if I decide that I don't like Turks, and I go and I hit you, that's genocide. Obviously, this is ridiculous. But this is the definition that is usually used. Indeed, according to this definition, Turks are guilty of genocide. And so is everyone else who has ever lived. Everyone who has gotten mad at someone and hit him because he was whatever he was, was guilty of genocide, which is absurd. Standard definitions of genocide include Deliberate destruction of physical life of individual human beings because they're in a group. So if one person is killed because they're in a group, genocide. Genocide is any act that puts the very existence of a group in jeopardy. You don't have to do anything, you just have to have an act that puts the group in jeopardy. So according to this, pretty much anything you want to do can be genocide. More reasonable explanations of genocide are ones like this. One-sided mass killings, so you have to kill a lot of people, in which you intend to destroy the group. In other words, for genocide, you have to not just dislike someone and hit them, you have to want all of them dead. Secondly, right, the group that you're attacking has to be essentially defenseless. Or in other words, if you're fighting a war with another group, and you kill them and they kill you, that can't be genocide. You have to be attacking innocent people. Now these kinds of definitions lead us to two serious questions about what happened to the Armenians in World War I. First of all, were they innocent? Or were they indeed combatants? Were they people who were fighting another group of people? Secondly, did the Ottomans intend to destroy the Armenians? Did they intend for all the Armenians to be killed? In order to understand this sort of thing, we need to have a certain, a certain understanding of what the situation was like. <coughs> the volume up? Yeah. I'm already hearing it in my ears. <laughs> Can everyone hear OK? Yeah. 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 Yes. All right. Every once in a while, we let this come in for comic relief. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, we first have to look at what Armenians wanted, or I should say what Armenian revolutionary groups wanted, because most Armenians, like most Turks, wanted to be left alone. But if you look at the Armenian population of the area that is claimed to be Armenia, which is this area here called the Six Vilayets, and the area down here, Cilicia, or the Chukurova region, if you look at these areas, you're going to notice that the population was not Armenian. The population was overwhelmingly Muslim. Kurds in the south, Turks in the north, but overwhelmingly Muslim and people who wouldn't want to stay in a Muslim government. That being the case, anyone who wanted to create an Armenia in this area wanted to create an, what we call an apartheid state, a state in which a small minority ruled over a large majority. And in order to do this successfully, <coughs> you would have to get rid of that majority in some way. So that's a very basic understanding of what was wanted. Secondly, a major question of the relocation of Armenians. In order to understand what actually went on, you have to look at what actually happened when the Armenians were moved. Armenians, about 439,000, were moved down here. This is what's called the deportation. Up here, almost the same number of Armenians actually were not deported, were not moved by the Ottomans at all. What they did was they fled before Ottoman armies. Now this is important to understand because if you look here, you'll notice that more Muslims fled before Armenians and Russians than Armenians fled. In other words, in this world in which people were moved back and forth to talk about only moving the Armenians 
is simply false. Demographers, people like myself, never talk about deportation, relocation. We call this forced migration. Forced migration is what happens when someone puts a gun in your back and says, you must move. And that's true whether you're a Muslim, whether you're an Armenian, whether you're a Turk or a Greek or a Kurd or whatever you might be. If someone holds a gun to you and says you have to move, the situation is the same. The same situation affected Muslims and Armenians. And the same things happened to them once they were moved. Specifically, sometimes they were killed by other people, but mostly they died of starvation and disease. Note that many more Muslims were forced out than Armenians. Something that's very seldom talked about. Anatolia, in the time at the end of the Ottoman Empire. Why were the Armenians relocated by the Ottomans? If you look at what people often tell you, they'll say, well, the Ottomans decided to move the Armenians because they wanted to kill them, or because they just didn't like them, or because of religious prejudice. As a matter of fact, relocating the Armenians was a rational political decision. It was a decision made for good reason. There were mistakes made, it may have happened but the reasons for doing it were very obvious. Specifically, Armenian groups, Armenian nationalist groups had given the Ottomans good reason, good reason to believe that they wanted to destroy the Ottoman Empire. This wasn't hidden. The groups that were nationalist revolutionaries and rebels against the Ottomans specifically stated that they intended to have revolts against the Ottoman government they specifically stated that they would have insurrections, and they specifically ordered the destruction of the Ottomans. Now, this wasn't something that was hidden away. This was something that was very much in the open. Everyone knew, and of course the Ottomans knew much more than this because they had spies who reported on everything. What you actually had was you have revolts that took place because of these principles, Specifically in the 1890s, major revolts in Zeytun, Sasun, Van, revolts in 1907-8 in Adana, and various incidents all over Eastern Anatolia, sponsored by revolutionaries, specifically Hunchak revolutionaries, it may be a name that you've heard before. The intention of these people was to cause Muslims to attack Armenians. Specifically, on a Friday in Erzurum, for instance, Muslims are going to the mosque, Armenians begin to shoot them from the roof, shoot at them from the rooftops and kill large numbers. The Muslims then, of course, move out and they attack Armenians. The news gets put to Europe, and the news that's sent to Europe is not that Mu Armenians started to kill Muslims, the news is that Muslims killed Armenians. What you have is you have people that want to cause trouble. You have people that want to cause provocations. They want to cause Muslims to kill Christians. They intend this to take place. They don't succeed. And the reason that they don't succeed is not that they weren't very effective. They were. It's not that they didn't, want, didn't get what they wanted. They got what they wanted. The reason was that the Europeans couldn't agree on what to do. The English thought, yeah, it's a good idea. Let's break up this place and put an Armenian land over the Muslims. Let's make an Armenian. The Russians said, yeah, let's make an Armenian because the Russians wanted to take it off themselves. But the British couldn't agree that the Russians should have it. The Russians couldn't agree that the Armenians should be independent. And so finally they just said, oh, forget it, and did nothing. But the Ottomans knew. They could see what the Armenian revolutionaries wanted. They understood. And because they understood, they had reason to be afraid. They also had reason to be afraid because after the 1890s, the Armenian revolutionary groups, especially a group called the Dashnaks, began to smuggle incredible amounts of guns and fighters from Russia, sometimes with Russian aid, sometimes by themselves. They brought these weapons into Places like Vaughan and Sasu, up in the north here, some by boat, most by land, going through Armenian villages. And when I say incredible amounts of guns, I mean, the Ottomans found a small percentage. 
of the guns that were brought in. Okay? But for instance, at one time in the city of Vaughan, in one occasion, they found 2,000 weapons. Okay? That's just one time. Mostly they didn't find them at all. There were many other occasions. They found dynamite bombs, they found grenades, they found handguns of all kinds, especially something called the Mauser C90 machine pistol, which was a fantastic weapon that the Armenian groups armed themselves with. Well, the Ottomans knew what this was, this was going on. They understood perfectly. I mean, why were these groups importing weapons? What was the purpose? It surely wasn't so they could hold peaceful dialogue. They intended revolution. And it was understood that their revolution would only be successful at a time when the Ottomans were at war. They needed to have the Ottomans busy fighting the Russians or someone else because everyone knew that the Armenians could never become independent on their own. They simply weren't enough of them. They weren't strong enough. And again, they were outnumbered three to one by the Muslims in their area. How could they possibly become independent unless the Ottomans were busy fighting the Russians? Which is exactly, exactly what they wanted to do. When the war began, Armenians began to act as agents of the Russian Empire. They began to act behind the lines as agents of Russia. And when they did this, the Ottomans reacted to them. The Ottomans reacted to their treason because the Ottomans knew that they could expect more treason from them. In order to understand this, we have to look at two factors. We have to look at transportation, supply, and we have to look at communications. Now, before I start talking about these things, this is a subject in which there is what we call much heat and not much light. When people talk about Armenian genocide, they tend not to talk about the facts that happened. They tend to talk about slogans. They tend to talk in insults. They tend to tell you that these are evil people. They tend to look at Turks, and sometimes Turks might do the same thing. Look at the other guy and say, that's the devil. Don't listen to the devil. In this case, obviously, to the university, <laughs> I'm the devil. <laughs> All right, don't tell our children. <laughs> The point is, if you really want to know what's going on, you can't have the fun stuff. I can't stand up here and tell you, evil, evil people, it's terrible, they're all going to hell. I can't do that. I have to give you the facts, and I'm sorry to say the facts sometimes aren't as interesting as if I stood up here and gave you a nice ranting talk about evil. You're going to get the facts. You're going to get it like it was a classroom. Specifically, we're going to talk about what happened in the smuggling, and what happened in the wars beforehand in which the Armenians signed up with the Russians and acted as agents of the Russians, and then went with the Russians, moved in with the Russians. Because when Russia came down into the areas that had been Muslim for centuries, when they took over these areas, they evicted the Muslim population and brought in Armenians. Now they did this partly because they wanted to have a population they could trust. They figured they could trust the Christians. They did this partly because the Armenians had aided them, had done things like deliver the plans of cities, had organized armed units to fight on the side of the Russians against the Muslim rulers. When this took place, and this is from the 1827 to 29, Muslims were expelled from the area that today is the Armenian Republic. Armenians were brought in from Iran and from the Ottoman Empire, partly because they supported the Russians, but mainly because they gave them tax breaks. I don't know if you do this in Australia, but in places like Kentucky, the state that I'm from, if we want a company to come, they'll say, hey, you know, you don't have to pay any taxes for 10 years. We'll give you free land. That's exactly what the Russians did. What that meant was, that the Armenians now were taking over the houses that it, the Muslims had lived in. It's very little known, but it's been demonstrated by an Armenian professor, that this area, that today is the Armenian Republic, before these wars, it was a Muslim majority, a Turkish Muslim majority population. Today, those people are all gone. 
lot of them did, a lot of them moved out. In 1877-78, similar kind of thing. In the area of Kars and Ardahan, which today has come back to Turkey, in that area, once again, the Turks were expelled and Armenians were brought in. Well, now, if you're the Ottoman government, and you look and you say, you know, there have been these wars. In each of these wars, the Armenians took the side of the Russians. The Russians rewarded them with land that they had taken from the Turks. In each of these occasions, the Armenians went over the Russians. Well, what are they going to do next time? If you don't think, you know, they're probably going to do the same thing, you'd be crazy. They noticed that the, the Armenians were smuggling weapons in. They noticed that the Armenians said that they were going to overthrow the Ottoman government. Well, if you're the Ottoman government, what else can you expect? But of course, the biggest thing, the most dangerous thing, was what happened right at the beginning of the war, because it proved, it proved that what took place had actually been a rebellion of the Armenians. Just before the beginning of the war, for the Ottomans in November of 1914. Just before that time and into that time, Ottoman intelligence reports in this area, from down here up to here, said that the Ottoman military recruiters had found no Armenian young men. That the Armenian young men who were, of course, supposed to serve in the army, they were supposed to be drafted like anyone else, right? Instead, they had done two things. They had gone to Russia, where they signed up, not in the Ottoman army, but in the Russian army to fight the Turks. Secondly, they had gone to form bands with Chete in Turkish, Chete bands, and they were planning the fight and starting the fight against Muslims in this area. Most of these people were Kurds down here. So basically what the Ottoman intelligence service said was, these Armenians in this whole region have become our enemies. Now notice we're not now talking just about a few revolutionaries. What we're talking about is a large group of people, the overwhelming majority of the young fighting age men who had either gone over to the Russians or who had organized into anti-Muslim, anti-Turkish, anti-Kurdish bands in their home areas. Roads. There are two fronts. There are two fronts, the Russian road in the areas of the revolution. Specifically, there are two fronts. There is the Russian front up here, and there is the Iranian front over here. The Russians realized that this, in many ways, was the most dangerous area for them. I'll explain why that goes on in a minute. So starting in 1910, and especially just before the war began, Russia occupied this part of Iran. So now the Ottomans had a front that goes this way and a front that goes this way. So they're faced, the Russians, faced with the Russians on two fronts. They're also faced with revolutionary Armenian bands attacking in all of the areas where you see the gun being held up. What you see in front of you there are the main roads. You see the main roads, the main transportation areas in the center and the east of Anatolia. There is one main road that goes towards Erzurum, and there is another set main road that goes towards Vaughan. Now, when I say main road, I mean there aren't other roads. There are no railroads. The reason there aren't is because the Russians wouldn't let the Ottomans build them. There are no railroads, there are no good secondary roads. There is one set of roads going this way and one set going this way. You need to have these roads to fight a war. The war is being fought here and the war is being fought here, which means you need to have roads that will bring your supplies, bring your troops, that will take out your wounded from the battles. You need to have also connection here between the two fronts. Because the one benefit the Ottomans should have is they should have interior lines of supply. The Russians have to fight around, but the Ottomans should be able to fight in the middle and move troops from one place to another. They should be able to communicate easily where the Russians are going to have a hard time, in theory. Right? 
In fact, that doesn't work because the Armenians make sure that it doesn't work. Communication. We don't often think about that sort of thing today because when you fight a war today, you've got satellite communications and GPS systems. Back in the time of World War I, if armies wanted to communicate, they had two choices. They could have telegraph lines that were set up, or they could have people on horses, people walking, people running. Obviously, the telegraph line was what was essential to fight what was then modern warfare. You had to have telegraph lines because that was the only way you could communicate quickly, communicate rapidly with other forces and with the center in Istanbul. You had to be able to do that. And so if you had your telegraph wires cut, you in many ways had already started to lose your war. What happened in Anatolia was <coughs> these main telegraph lines one across here and the one down here were essential to the Ottoman war effort. They had to simply be controlled by the Ottomans, but they weren't. Armenian guerrilla bands, sometimes in the tens of thousands, attacked in the areas that you see, in the main areas that we'll talk about in a minute, with all of these areas in here cutting wires repeatedly. So much so that the Ottomans had to send whole divisions of soldiers away from the front just to protect the telegraph lines. And now think, how difficult is it to cut a telegraph line? What you do is you go up with the wire cutters and you cut it and you roll up as much as you can and you ride away before the soldiers get there. It became almost impossible for the Ottomans to hate many of their telegraph lines open, as we'll see, especially in the south. Why? Because the Ottoman revolutionaries were acting as the agents of the Russian army, making sure that the Ottomans would lose the war by their actions. I want to specifically talk about three areas. The area of Sivas, Shibin Karahisar, or Karahisar Isharka, as the Ottomans called it, the area of Vaughan and the area of Adana. Because these are three areas that illustrate what the Armenians are doing very well. And in, talk, in terms of talking about those areas, let's start with Sibi, uh, Shemin, Karahisar, and Sivas. This was an area, because of the roads that you can see on the map, an area that was essential to the supply of the main Ottoman army, which was fighting against the Russians on the border of the Russian Empire. If you wanted to supply the Ottoman army, you had to go through that territory. If you wanted to get your wounded back out to hospitals, you had to go through that territory. There was simply no other way to do it. It had to go that way. But that means if you want to damage the Ottoman war effort, that's the place you cut the lines. And indeed, if you look at the area, this region in here is where the telegraph lines go, these little blue lines. This region is the railroad that goes up to the Black Sea, which is pretty much useless at that time. And these are the roads that go through, the primary roads and the secondary roads. In that region, as you go to the front, you find the area of Sivas. You find the, the province of Karahusa, and you find that these are regions in which there were so many Armenian rebels that they made troops. The Ottomans estimated at 15,000 people, most of them on horses, that were attacking the Ottoman lines, attacking supply lines, attacking especially men that were, uh, when the Ottomans had to retreat, destroy, destroying the telegraph lines, you name it. Now, when you look at this region, you say to yourself, is this an Armenian revolution? Are these people who are revolting in order to get freedom for their people? Because that's understandable. If this is what they were doing, you say to yourself, well, all right, rebels do revolt. I mean, Americans revolted against the British and made a country. But look at the area. If you look at Sivas, notice the population of Armenians and the population of Muslims. 
almost all of them Turks, and some uh, some uh, Alevi Kurds. Uh, if you look at that region, you say, this is really a stupid place to revolt. How could you possibly expect that you're going to create your country in this area? You're so overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly taken over by Muslims. So if you're going to revolt, you might revolt in Vaughan, you might revolt in uh, you know, any number of other places, but not here. So why in the world would you do that? And the reason you would do it is because you want to help the Russians against the Ottoman army. And this is the perfect place to do it. You don't revolt because there's a good reason for your revolution. You revolt because you want to help the Russians. And you want you hope that the Russians are going to help you once they win the war. And this is exactly what takes place. It would be a really stupid place for any kind of revolt because between the rebels, between the rebels in Chibikata Hissar, Sivas area, the entire Ottoman Third Army is between them and the Russians who are supposedly going to help them. How can any place be a dumber place to revolt unless you're going to make guerrilla movements that attack the Ottoman forces behind the lines, which is exactly what took place. Just to give you a feeling for how they could do that kind of thing. This is the Sivas Erzinjan Road. Shibin Kata Hisar over here, Sivas down here. If you want to know how they could be successful in attacking the Ottoman forces, because there were many more forces, you got to realize these are areas where people ride up in the hills, go down quickly, attack the convoy, go back up in the hills. Ride down really quickly, cut the telegraph wires, go back up in the hills. These are areas where guerrillas are very, very effective. And as I say, the Ottomans estimated, maybe an exaggeration, but they estimated that there were 15,000 of these people in this region alone. In other words, the Ottomans had good reason, good reason to worry about these people. And what they were doing only makes sense if they were intending to help the Russian army. If you look at Adam, this is a region where there are more Armenians than there were in Sivas, but if you look at this region, if you look at Sivas, if you look at Adana, if you look at all these other regions in which people revolted, huh? you see that the revolts had very little to do with any idea of what we would think of as rebellion, surely not of a majority population. In Adana, they had tried to revolt once before. But in this case, the revolting areas that took place in Adana, Urfa and other areas as well, this region, are there for one specific reason. They're there because the Ottoman railway line that leads to Palestine and leads to Iraq goes through this region and has not been completed in two areas, Bozanta and over here. These two regions, the Ottomans have to take their equipment off the trains, move them by ox cart, take them down and put them on other trains. In order to go to Iraq, they've got to do this twice. In order to go to Palestine, they've got to do it once. Well, what better place to cause trouble? And that's exactly what they do. They revolt because the area is not a good area for Armenian revolution. They revolt because it helps the Ottomans' enemies. In this region, this is something that has a special ties to Australians. Because I've heard people talk about ties between Russian Armenian revolts and Gallipoli and things. Most of the I've looked at it and said, that's crazy. But there is something that is, that is a tie. When the war began, Armenian revolutionaries from this area went to the British. And they said to the British, we have tens of thousands of men who will fight on the side of the British against the Ottomans. They said, if the British will land here in the Ayas Bayas in the Bay of Iskenderun, if they will land down here, they can cut the Ottoman Empire in half, destroy Ottoman communications, win the wars easily in Iraq and in Palestine, wipe the Ottoman Empire out, in essence, if the British will do this. And in order to help the British do it, we have tens of thousands of Armenians who will join you. All you have to do is provide us with guns, because unlike the Armenians up here, 
it was very hard to smuggle guns all the way down here. So the rebels simply didn't have enough guns to fight. If the British would just land them some guns, if the British would agree to invade there, it would have a tremendous effect. Well, these Armenians were right. They did all they could to convince the British. And they did convince some people. Lord Kitchener, for instance, the head of the army, was convinced. They managed to get people, Armenian groups from America, from Bulgaria, from all over the place, to write into the British, to complain, to try political. They said, you got to do this. The Armenians will help you win the war. And the British said, nope. We refuse to listen to you because we have this idea about Gallipoli. And instead of doing this, which probably would have won them the war really quickly, because the Ottomans had literally no forces here. No forces. If the British would have listened to the Armenians, they probably would have won the war a year, two years earlier than they did in the Middle East. The Ottomans knew what the Armenians suggested. And the Ottomans knew that the British had been really stupid. But they also knew they couldn't trust those Armenians. In Vaughan, well, in Vaughan, in the area that is in the far southeastern part of Anatolia, the headquarters city, if you will, of eastern Anatolia, of southeastern Anatolia, in Vaughan there is perhaps the best example of Armenians helping the Russians. Specifically, Armenian rebellion that had begun in Vaughan even before the war began. In September of 1914, two months before the war actually began, Armenians began at the beginning of this time to revolt. Right? The Russians, as I told you before, had seized the area in Iran. The Russians were threatening the Ottomans on two sides. At the beginning of the war, Armenians began to revolt in Vaughan province, and those Chetes, those partisan groups that I told you about, began killing Muslim civilians. The Russians were in the north, the Russians were, on, were in the east. So the question was where they would attack. And for people, military historians, to look at this area, the question is, the question is where would the Ottomans be hurt most? And the answer is in mountain passes, in main roads that go through valleys, through mountains, and with telegraph lines. In Vaughan, the most dangerous areas for the Ottomans were the areas where telegraph lines could be cut because these telegraph lines were the only real way they had to get out to the outside world to get orders to find out what was going on and especially the areas of passes here, passes that came through to the Russians who were over in Iran. Now those were the areas they had to worry about the most. The areas of Sarai, Kultur, and down here, which you can't see too well, the area of Deir that goes up to Chu. These are the region, these are the areas where the Russians were most likely to be able to go through. But very importantly for the Ottomans, they were the areas that were the most easy to defend. The military people talk, and I'm sure we have people with military experience here, about a force multiplier. In other words, if you're in a mountain valley, and the other troops have to go through underneath, and you're stationed up on the side, well, you're worth 10 of them because of your position. So the Ottomans, in theory, should have been able to hold that, even though they had far fewer troops that were available right on the path. That was the idea. Yeah. Unfortunately for them, it didn't work out too well. It didn't work out too well because the Armenians made sure that they couldn't do it. This is the road, the Deer Dilmon Road, just to get, to give you a feeling for what these places are like. We're not talking about going down the peaceful river outside, outside our doors here in Melbourne. We're talking about rough, rugged, awful train. If you've ever, any, some of you may have been in this region, you'll know what I mean. It's not the easiest place to be in. It's extremely difficult. Kotor Pass, another one of the passes that you'll see, uh, these pictures, which are from Google Earth, don't really give you give justice to the whole thing. But if you get the idea that these are difficult areas, and also areas that should be easy to defend, 
you get the idea. All right? In the area of Sarai, <coughs> Armenian revolts took place in a region where there weren't any Armenians. Less than 5% of the Armenians of, of the area were Armenians. Almost all of them were Kurdish tribes, many of them nomadic. So how in the world could Armenians have a revolt there? And the answer is they came from all over. Why did they come from all over? Well, not to revolt in their homeland, obviously. They came to attack the Ottoman forces. And to attack the Ottoman forces that were defending against the Russians, they attacked them from behind. Russians from this way, Armenians from this way. The Armenian rebels actually defeated the Ottoman forces that were there, killing 400 Turkish soldiers. Down in other areas, for instance, down here in the Deer Boschkali area, at the beginning of the war, the Russians came in. When the Russians came in, the Armenians in Boschkali killed every single Muslim man, woman, and children who couldn't get away. And then, when the Russians were forced to retreat, the Armenians all, of course, had to run away. This was also a forced migration, but it's, it's understandable why they had to run away. Notice that these are not people's rebellions. These are not people rising up to defend their own land. These are not people who believe they should be free. These are people who are acting as agents of foreign invaders and acting against the majority population of their area. If you look at the region of Vaughan, the city of Vaughan, was a place where perhaps the most telling Armenian revolt took place. In the city of Vaughan, Armenians on April 20th, 1915, revolted and <coughs> took over all of the city except for a small area up here, the Kale district, the Citadel district, took over all these areas, forcing the Ottomans up into each Kale, a small Iraqi area to the north. They took over this land and they held the city against their own government until the Russians could come in. Now, you can't get more rebellious or more treasonous than that. Really. <coughs> yeah. In the old city of Vaughan, they not only took over all these areas, but they destroyed every government building, and they killed all the Muslims who were possibly in their way who couldn't get away. They held out until May 16th to 17th, until the Russian army could come in. When the Russian army finally came in, they gave the Russian commander the keys to the city. Welcome, brother Russians. All over Vaughan, all over this region, Armenians revolted. But not always in areas where there were a lot of Armenians, many times the rebels came to places where there weren't many Armenians, but always in order to defeat the Ottomans. Specifically, I want to look at some areas, the areas of Havasor, Givash, Karchikov, not names that you're probably too familiar with. Over here on this side of Lake Vaughan. These are really important regions. Not because they have a whole lot of population or anything else, but because they are on the roads and the telegraph lines that connect Vaughan to the rest of the Ottoman Empire. If you want to move your troops back and forth to Vaughan, if you want to have communication, you have to go through this territory. In theory, in theory, there should be telegraph lines that go up this way towards Erzurum, but as a matter of fact, they were so cut by Armenians that they ceased to have any use at all. The Ottomans did try to keep those telegraph lines open. And they tried very hard, and they failed miserably. This was especially important, as we're going to see at the end of the war, when the Ottomans needed these territories to regroup to fight the Russians that were invading, which they were somewhat successful at for a while. They were especially important, and they were also especially easy to cut by guerrillas. These areas, if you see them, are areas in which the roads went through this kind of relatively low mountains. 
but more than high enough for guerrillas to fight back and forth, go into the mountains, back again, to cut the, to cut the supply lines of the Ottomans, to cut the telegraph lines, and as we're going to see, especially to kill the people that we're going through in this area. Uh, ideal areas then for guerrillas and ambushes. The telegraph line that went through there also was in an ideal place for people to come out of these high ground areas and come out here and cut the lines because the lines had to go through mountainous passes. There wasn't any other way. So the roads, the telegraph lines, everything else, the main road that led to the third army, which was in Erzinjan command, the secondary poor roads to the south were really pretty much no use at all, but they also were cut by Armenians. When the Ottomans lost, as we'll see, they needed these routes to retreat as the Russians were coming in. So the Armenians, who had been active in cutting the lines, who had been active in making sure the Ottomans would be defeated by the Russians, they now proceeded to slaughter all of the Muslims that tried to retreat on these roads. If you read a book that I and my colleagues wrote about the rebellions in Vaughan, you'll notice that even though I don't usually talk about horrible things, the horrible things that went on there, people couldn't drink the water because the water was so red with blood. And bodies were everywhere. Every single Muslim that they got a hold of, they killed. In order for these refugees, these Muslim refugees, to be protected, the soldiers who should have been off fighting had to be left behind in order to protect the Kurds from the Armenians. All over Vaughan then, in regions, where, in regions where there were lots of Armenians and regions where there weren't many Armenians, all over these areas, you had Armenians revolting against their own government. And there was no question but that this was not any longer just a small group. The Russians, just before the war, the Russian diplomats in places like Vaughan, report, I'm sorry, Russian, British diplomats, places like Vaughan, just before the war, reported back that the whole Armenian population was in favor of the Russians and wanted the Russians to come in and take over. Now, the British didn't like the Turks much. There's no reason for them to lie. But that's what they said happened. Cutting communications. And I told you this was going to be like a class with lots of facts. Cutting communications lines. Once again, let's look at Vaughan. The primary communication line was that line that I showed you that went this way, the telegraph lines. If you did not use, if you could not use those lines, if the Armenians cut the lines again and again and again and again and it was useless, and it was, the governor. Jevdet in Vaughan, and Vaughan could not communicate with the center, could not communicate with the Third Army, couldn't do any of this. The only other way to communicate was the way they did try to do, which was to send people, to send telegraph lines to the south through Bashkale, down the Neri, in which they were given to people on horses and on foot, and they had then to carry these messages down to Rwanda's, where they were then sent on the telegraph line to Baghdad up from Baghdad to Istanbul. So the only way you could communicate from Vaughan, because of the Armenians, the only way you could communicate was down by horse and by telegraph through Baghdad. Now, as you can imagine, that meant that not too much communication actually took place. But it also meant that if you really want to help the Russians, if you really want to ruin the communications, where would you attack? And the answer is, of course, that you would attack in the areas where the telegraph lines were going. You had already cut the lines over here. You were cutting the lines down here. And now you tried to cut the line to the south. These people are revolting in the very places, are attacking in the very places that most aid the Russians. The places that they attack whether it was down here for the telegraph lines, whether it was up here for the passes, whether it was over here for the telegraph lines, whether it was when the Muslims were treated, all were in aid of the Russians. And you say, well, how could killing all the, all the Muslims that are retreating, killing every one of them, if, everyone you could get, how did that help the Russian army? 
It helped the Russian army because it clogged the roads. It meant that the Ottoman army couldn't move. It meant that instead of fighting the Russians, the Ottomans had to put their forces out in order to save the people from the Armenians. As we're going to see, it meant that Ottoman manpower was significantly restricted. It may even have meant that the Ottomans lost the war in the East because of not. This is Azerbaijan, northern Azerbaijan, which today is, uh, is the Azerbaijan Republic, the southern part of Azerbaijan, which was in Iran, all the same people, Shia Turks, I'm down here Kurds. In this area, the Ottomans looked and they realized, and the Russians realized, that this was the soft underbelly where you could attack the Russians. The Russians and the Ottomans were fighting up here. Russians had come down to the area where the Diyadin Bay is at the Diyadin Road comes. The Ottomans were holding this territory. Now originally, Tenver Pasha, who was the Ottoman Minister of War, uh, and was a little crazy actually, that's the only way you can put it. He had made attacks that were not completely reasonable. He had, for instance, intended to attack through Iran all the way up to Central Asia. He was going to attack the Russians in Uzbekistan. Not terribly reasonable. He sent the Ottoman forces up to attack the Russians in Sarukhamish, going over the Allahu Akbar mountains in the winter without shoes. And of course they lost. Not reasonable. But finally, finally more reasonable voices took place. And Enver, and of course his advisors, came up with a good plan. A good plan that was put in the hands of Enver's uncle, actually, Khalil Pasha. Specifically, the plan was to attack to the north with forces that came down, that came from Baghdad originally, up here, and were going to attack the Russians here. If the Russians could be defeated in Iran, there were not major Russian forces between the Ottomans and Azerbaijan and all the Kurds who lived in this area. This is really important because the Ottomans had very deficient in cavalry. They needed to have horsemen to fight. The Russians had Cossacks. They needed to have horsemen to fight for them. But the Kurds were, you know, the nomadic Kurds. The city Kurds were all on the Ottoman side. But the nomadic Kurds, you don't know. They were only going to go with the winner, or maybe with nobody at all if they could help it. The Ottomans demonstrated in the early days what Jebdet, the governor of Oman, actually managed to get all the way over to take Tabriz from the Russians. The Ottomans knew that if they came through, they could tie up with the Azeris, who weren't too happy with the Russians anyway, and they could convince the Kurds that the Turks were going to win. And that meant that they could actually cause the Russians either to lose that area, and, or at the very least to move massive amounts of troops over there and save the rest of Ottoman Anatolia. It's a good plan. A good plan, but unfortunately, in military history, we notice that everything sort of balances. Everything hinges on whether you succeed or not. In a battle, if you win the battle, your enemy runs away and you defeat him completely. If you lose, your people run away and you're defeated completely. Even if the forces are very close, still, you can rout the other side. The Ottomans knew that they had in theory, about 30% more troops than the Russians. That meant that when they attacked in that area, even though the Russians had the superiority of defense, that the Ottomans had a very good chance of defeating them. And people like myself who look at this say that they probably would have defeated them. The Russians very hastily and quickly set up defenses, not too great defenses, but defenses in the city of Dilmat. They set up these defenses, waited for the Ottomans to come. The Ottomans attacked, and for a couple days, fighting went back and forth. But finally, it was very close. Finally, the Ottomans were defeated. And when they were defeated, they had to run like hell. When the Ottomans were defeated, the Russians followed them in. Russian armies went all over here with those horsemen, those Cossacks that I talked about, going very quickly, taking this whole area of the east until the Ottomans finally could finally hold them at the Battle of Milazgrim, which they did for a while. 
ultimately the Russians ended up taking that too. Uh, all because of that one defeat. The Kurds never went over to help the Ottomans. In fact, those Kurdish people all through the war, the, Kurd, the nomadic Kurds never helped the Ottomans again. Some indeed helped the Russians. Most just didn't get involved in the war at all. The Ottomans lost because of that. Why did they lose the Battle of Dilman? Some of their best fighters, the Von Mobile Gendarmerie Unit, Gendarmerie Unit, 3,000 men in the unit, were busy in Vaughn fighting Armenians. More than 6,000 Ottoman troops were battling Armenians within the borders of Vaughn. Not counting all the ones in the north that were fighting Armenians, just in Vaughn. 6,000. More than enough to turn the tide of battle. More than enough to win the Battle of Dilman. More than enough to make sure that the Russians would not sweep through eastern Anatolia and manage to get all the way through Erzurum, Trabzon, and all the other areas that they took. No one really knows, of course, how much things would have changed if Halil Pasha had won that war, had won that battle. He should have won. Everything should have turned out differently. Entire wars have turned on that kind of loss or gain in one battle. And it was the Armenian rebels who forced Halil to lose that battle. To me, when I look at this evidence, I cannot help but believe that the Armenians were acting as conscious agents of the Russian enemies of the Ottoman Empire and enemies of the Turks. There are lots of other reasons too. We know, for instance, that the rebels, the Dashnak party rebels, just before the war began, went north to the Russian Empire and got the equivalent of $15 million in supplies to buy guns from the Russians. We can see that the actions of the rebels were simply too well designed to be coincidence. We can see that all of these actions were to aid the Russians. Why? Because the Armenians thought the Russians would give them an independent Armenia. I think this was crazy. The Russians only intended to take it themselves, but the Russians were perfectly willing <coughs> to use the Armenians, and the Armenians were perfectly willing to be used. We talked before about all those Armenians <coughs> that went north. Half of them died, probably more than half. They starved to death and died of disease. Why? Because when the Russians took back the land, Vaughn and other places where the Armenians had been, they wouldn't let the Armenians go home. They wouldn't let them have food. They wouldn't let them grow their crops. The Russians said, let them die. They didn't care about the Armenians, but the Armenians thought they would, and that's all that counts. So, the Ottomans. Why did the Ottomans relocate the Armenians? Why did they move them? It was because they justifiably feared them. It was because they were right to fear them. They were agents of the Russians, the Armenians were. They were people who were slaughtering thousands, ultimately millions of Muslims. Was the relocation of the Armenians a harsh measure? You bet. Was it justified? Well, in history, we can't say what if. But it seems very much like it was justified. We'll never know for sure, but we do know for sure that relocating the Armenians cut the Ottoman losses tremendously. And by Ottoman losses, I don't just mean soldiers, I mean all the civilians who would have been killed. More were surely saved than were ever lost. But we do know one thing for sure. Relocation of the Armenians was an act that was justified in wartime. It might not have been done perfectly, there were lots of mistakes, God knows, but it surely was not in any sense genocide. Where the Armenian mortality was worse indeed, was worse indeed, was not among the Armenians who were relocated. The Armenians who were relocated suffered about 20% deaths. Most of them from disease, some from starvation. This is terrible. 20% death rate is awful. But the Armenians who weren't relocated 
the Armenians who went up with the Russians, they suffered more than 50% death. So if you were an Armenian, you were doing much better if you were relocated than if you went off with the Russians, your supposed friends. And in order to make that comparison of the, rush, of the relocation of the Armenians, of the suffering of the Armenians who were moved, we also have to look at what happened to the Muslims who were relocated. We have to look at provinces like Vaughan that I've been talking about so much tonight in which almost two-thirds of the Muslims were dead at the end of the war. Two-thirds. In other provinces, not quite as bad, but still third, fourth, 50 percent, tremendous numbers of Muslims dead. And you have to say, when we're talking about more than a million Muslim refugees, just in the east, when we're talking about provinces in which two-thirds of the people can be killed, when we're talking about both Armenians and Muslims dying of starvation and disease and of killing each other, then we're obviously not talking about genocide. We're talking about war, horrible war. A war in which everybody that fights is to some extent guilty and to some extent innocent. who did what they could to lessen the suffering of the Armenians. There is no question but that there were territories in which Armenians were massacred, I mean real massacres, especially the area of Harput and the area of Trabzon, where they were taken out in boats and the boats were sunk. There's no question that this took place. Armenians killed Muslims in exactly the same way in which we've talked about, in which there was tremendous slaughter. The difference is, when the Armenians massacred Muslims of Van, Adana, Siva, Asurfa, and the Turks massacred, well, Kurds here, Turks up here, massacred Armenians, the Turks took the guilty parties to court. The Turks held trials. The Turks held trials and convicted, as you see, all these areas, not here because the Russians were there, but all these other areas, these were people that were convicted for crimes against the Armenians. In wartime, people do bad things. They kill their enemies when they shouldn't. They kill women and children. They steal from people. They do bad things. Everybody does it. But the Turks, the Turks convicted their criminals. More than 2,000 of them. They hung a tremendous number, including an Ottoman governor who was convicted of crimes against the Armenians and was hung. More than 2,000. How many Armenians and Russians who killed Turks, how many of them were tried and convicted? None. Not a single one. So I ask you, who is guilty of genocide here? The Armenians of Istanbul, Izmir, Edirne were not touched. If this was genocide, it was a strange genocide indeed. Can you imagine Hitler saying to the Jews of Berlin, we're going to leave you alone, no problem. <laughs> of course not. The fact of the matter is, when you look at what we talked about and what we said was genocide, when you look at the summary, were the Armenians essentially defenseless? defenseless? They fought on the side of the Russians. They helped the Ottomans be defeated. They attacked everywhere. They murdered Muslim civilians. How can you call them defenseless? They were attackers. This is like saying the wolves that attack the sheep are essentially defenseless, and it's the sheep's fault. Intends to destroy a group. Did the Ottomans intend to destroy the Armenians? 80% of the Armenians they relocated survived. The Armenians of Istanbul and Izmir and Edirne were not even relocated. Nothing happened to them. The worst Armenian losses were in battle zones, and the worst of all was up with the Russians. The Ottomans convicted people who had attacked the Armenians. 
how could this possibly show that they intended to destroy a group? In fact, it's obvious that they did not in any sense mean to destroy the group, because if they did, the first to go would have been the Armenians of Istanbul. And when last I looked, they're still there. There is no evidence of any intent of the Ottomans to kill the Armenians. And people have been searching for a long time. The British, after the war, had the whole Ottoman archives in their hands, and they searched and searched and searched. They never found a thing. No one since then has ever found a thing. And whenever we look for people that say there was evidence, we find what we call smoke and mirrors. Nobody ever has real evidence because it didn't happen. Now, as much as we don't, I've given you a class, a very professorial sort of class, talked about the facts, but I must admit there are a lot of facts we don't know. A lot of details about the Armenian Rebellion. We don't know a lot of the places where the telegraph wires were cut. We don't know which lines. We don't know how many times they were cut. We don't know how many roadblocks were created. We don't have a lot of this evidence. We're still working on it. We don't know the exact numbers of convoys that were destroyed by roads. But every time we learn more, and the more we learn, the more we understand why the Ottomans relocated the Armenians, why they sent the Armenians to Syria. And we know, from what we already know, we can be certain that the Ottomans were correct in fearing Armenian rebellion, and that the Ottomans were justified in taking action against it.